Welcome back to Green is Good, and we're so honored to have our good friend and a repeat guest, David Mizajewski, on with us. And David is the is the a naturalist, a spokesperson, and the media personality representing the National Wildlife Federation. Welcome back to Green is Good, David. Thanks for having me again. Oh, happy to have you on. And you're just, you were so amazing as a guest uh, uh, when we had you on last time. We were thrilled to have you on again. And so um, we're here, you know, and, and, and just for our listeners out there that are with us on the show, uh, please go to, it's just a, an amazing website, David's website, the National Wildlife Federation. It's www.nwf.org. I'm on it right now while we're talking to David. David, you have some great things coming up. Can you talk a little bit about the Garden for Wildlife Month? That's coming up. That's right. Yeah, this is going to be the third annual Garden for Wildlife Month. It's the entire month of May. And what it is, is it's really a big promotion that we do to try to encourage as many people out there across America to get outdoors, to look at what the, what's going on in their yard and their garden, and think about it um, through the lens of what the local, you know, sort of ecosystem, the local wildlife are going to be needing. Because even though gardens are green, that doesn't mean that they're always necessarily sort of environmentally friendly. And there's some really simple, fun things that you can do that will actually make your yard fit better into the local environment and attract all sorts of cool birds and butterflies and other kinds of backyard wildlife. You know, it's so amazing because on, on today's show earlier, we had Lisa Novick from the Theodore Payne Foundation, and she was talking specifically about native plants and things just about what you're talking about in terms of wildlife. Why don't you hit upon that and talk about the importance of natural wildlife in our backyards and in the communities that we live in. Absolutely, yeah. So, so the National Wildlife Federation has actually been doing this for 40 years. Wow. Um, this year is actually the 40th anniversary of our Certified Wildlife Habitat Program, and that's what Garden for Wildlife Month is all about promoting. Oh. This is a program that we, that we designed back in 1973 that, that really was about two things. It was about helping out the wildlife that's losing habitat because of human activity in urban and suburban areas. So development, um, you know, roads, pollution, all of these things that kind of make it harder for um, wild animals to survive. So it's about helping the wildlife, but we also created this program to help people. We know that people spend so, you know, so much more time indoors than they used to, and that's not a good thing, both for our health and also our ability to sort of know about nature. And so this is a program designed to, again, try to get folks to turn off their TV and get outside, even if it's just in your yard. And you really will find out that nature is all around you. And like I said, if there's a couple, you know, things that you do in your existing yard, you can make it even better. So, um, um, you know, what are those things? What yeah. are the things that we that we try yeah. to get folks to do? You mentioned native plants, right? And that really is kind of the backbone of creating a wildlife friendly garden because oh. Mother Nature provides habitat first and foremost through the plant community. And so if you if you kind of learn from Mother Nature and look what she does out in in, in the true wild, you can kind of mimic that in your yard. And there's mm. four things that all wildlife species need: okay. they're food, water cover or shelter, and then places where the wildlife can breed and raise their young. And native plants actually provide three of those four things. Wow. Um, you know, the, the, the plants are at the bottom of the food chain, as I just mentioned. So, right. so plants are providing food in the form of seeds, nuts, berries, in some cases foliage, um, nectar, pollen, sap. All of these are ways that plants are providing food to a whole variety of different wildlife. They also are, are, are the food for smaller critters, insects, and um, smaller animals that become food for animals higher up on the food chain. So you really need to have a good, um, a good diversely planted garden. You want to focus on native plants, which again are the, the species that just naturally evolved in your area. They're the species that the local wildlife have, have depended upon for you know, thousands, tens of thousands of years. And they're the things that the plants that are best for providing the food and then as well the shelter and the places to raise young for the wildlife. So that really does need to be um, the first thing that you think about when you think about creating a wildlife friendly garden and and participating in the National Wildlife Federation Certified Wildlife Habitat Program. You know, David, so you, you create this wildlife friendly garden. Just, you know, I live now in New York City and I grew up in New York City. Talk about then the animals that are potentially could even show up once you've created this wonderful, you know, wildlife friendly garden that you're, you're, you're articulating so well. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I think is so cool about this concept yeah. and, our, and our program is that it doesn't matter where you live. 
It doesn't matter how much space you have. It doesn't Mm. matter what your budget is. If you can do any kind of gardening, even if it's just container gardening, even if you're in the middle of of Manhattan and New York City, there are things that you can do that will actually help out the local wildlife. And um, again, all it really requires is that you have just a teensy little bit of space and um, that you can actually get some plants in the ground. But, you know, if you have a, a rooftop um, garden. If you have a balcony or a deck or, you know, even just a window box in some cases, you can meet those basic requirements of food, water, shelter, places to raise young for certain wildlife species. So um, as far as the kinds of species that yeah. are going to show up, yeah. that, that really is dependent upon how you, how you provide that habitat and where you are. So, you know, again, in the middle of New York City, you're probably not going to get deer strolling through, <laughs> you know, your neighborhood, unless you're right near, you know. Central Park. You know, the, yeah, exactly. But, um, but, yeah, so I think it really depends. I mean, if you're in an urban area, yeah. probably you're looking at birds, butterflies, and other insects. And, and just, a, you know, a little Which anecdote. still beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And important. You know, we mean yeah. those, those animals count as wildlife. Right. Um, you know, um, I did, I had a, a series on Animal Planet a few years back all about this idea of gardening for wildlife. It was called Backyard Habitat. And we, we traveled the country and we kind of made over garden spaces and made them into wildlife friendly um, habitats that the National Wildlife Federation then certified in our program. And we, we did a few episodes in Chicago, which is known, it's sort of, Chicago is a city that's known for having green roofs. These are, you know, converting the rooftop yeah. of buildings instead of just having, you know, asphalt shingles or, or, you know, gravel up on the top of buildings, actually turning them into garden spaces. And, and I'll tell you, I was skeptical as to the, the value for wildlife that some of these rooftop gardens would have. And, and City Hall in Chicago is known for having this amazing rooftop garden, but it's 13 stories up. And I was thinking to myself, you know, what's going to really be up there? Let me tell you, I my jaw dropped when I got up there. There, it was literally teeming with wildlife. There were so many cool butterflies, wow. and dragonflies, and beetles, and other cool insects, bees that were pollinating everything. There were a ton of different kind of bird species, and not just you know the pigeons and the you know the sparrows that you might think of in being in the city. They actually had raptors that would patrol around there, and lots of different songbirds. So, so you know, again. The point is, is that no matter where you live, if you live in the city, yeah. if you live in the country, or probably like most people that this program is going to appeal to, if you just have you know, a typical suburban backyard, there are simple things that you can do that, you can, um, that will make your yard more environmentally friendly, more wildlife friendly, and will make you eligible to participate in National Wildlife Federation's program, specifically for Garden for Wildlife Month in May. If you just joined us now, we have David Mizjuski on with us from the National Wildlife Federation, and please go to their website. We're talking about out there, uh, Garden for Wild, Wildlife Month. It's uh, wonderful and gorgeous. I have it up in front of me. Website. It's www.nwf.org. David, so le- we, what we love to talk about on this show is pro- problems that are out there, and then we like to give solutions. So how easy it, and how, how do people create a wildlife-friendly garden in particular? And, and explain a little bit about that whole, you know, how easy it is. Yep. Well, one of the first things that I'll tell folks is um, definitely check out our website that you've that you've plugged a couple times. It's nwf.org, and if you go slash garden, it will take you right into our wildlife gardening um, info. And we have lots of different projects and ideas and kind of step-by-step um, articles and info on how to do all of this stuff. But again, the thing that you want to think about are are the four components of habitat that you want to apply into your garden space. So they're food, water cover or shelter, and then places for the wildlife to raise their young. So keeping it really super simple, um, as far as providing food, you definitely want to think about the plants first. As I've mentioned, native plants are best. And um, again, because that's how Mother Nature feeds the wildlife. So even if you go out and and say um, plant a few wildflowers that are going to provide nectar to butterflies and bees and other pollinators, uh, that's a a form of food. And those same wildflowers might then also later in the season go to seed, and then they'll produce seeds for birds like, you know, goldfinches and um, other seed-eating birds. So right there, that's one, one kind of plant. And I'm thinking of things like very common garden plants, black-eyed Susans, purple coneflowers, things like that that you can get in almost any garden center. Um, these are going to be good food sources hmm. for different kinds of wildlife. If you want to plant a shrub that maybe also has flowers that are going to provide nectar or pollen, um, and then those will later in the season produce berries. So anything, you know, blueberries, uh, black 
blackberries, huckleberries, um, elderberries. These are all, you know, great plants that uh, many that are native, depending on where you are in the country, that will provide that sort of double whammy, um, you know, nectar and then also, you know, seeds or fruit later in the season. So again, even if you only have, you know, containers, you know, there's there, you should have enough space to provide a couple, you know, wildflower plants and then maybe a couple shrubs. If you have a bigger space, obviously you can add more of these kinds of things. That's going to form the basis of, of the food in your garden. Now, if you want to supplement that for birds, it's totally okay to put up a few bird feeders. Hmm. But I also, you know, I always try to emphasize the point that bird feeders are kind of like the fast food of, <laughs> of you know, sort of the backyard yeah. habitat. And so birds really do truly only use them to supplement the natural foods that they're finding That's out in the landscape. And <laughs> only a handful of bird species will actually even visit a bird feeder. So if you really are thinking about it and you want to help out the wildlife and you want to meet this first component of food, you know, think of it in in that right order, that you want to do your plants first. They're going to provide all the, you know, again, the seeds, the nuts, the berries, the fruit. They'll also support the insects that birds need, especially in the springtime. You know, something like 96% of, of, of sort of songbirds in, in the eastern part of the North America, at, at any rate, where this has been studied, rely on insects as a primary food source for themselves and their babies. That's so that becomes important, too, when you think about things like spraying pesticides and chemicals all over your yard. If you wipe out the insects, you wipe out the the, the bird food. Well, so that's that, important to remember as and, well. And talk about that. Insects and, 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 and uh, garden pests and stuff of that nature, weeds that all, you know, that, that crop up then yep. when, when you, uh, you know, start to venture into this uh, wildlife uh, idea. So what happens then? How do you, how, is this good or bad and how do you deal with it? Yeah. So one of the biggest questions that we get at National Wildlife Federation when we talk about creating these wildlife friendly gardens yeah. is, oh, does that mean that my yard is just going to be covered in weeds? And yeah. does that mean that, you know, I'm going to be like the neighbor that has all the, you know, the rats in my yard or nothing but like raccoons, you know, coming in and getting to my trash cans? And the answer to those questions is no. The whole idea here is, like, I, like I've been saying, it's kind of mimic Mother Nature. Right. Um, that doesn't mean that you have to invite every single animal out there into the <laughs> world. And there are certainly species that are more appropriate and less appropriate. So our program is not about, um, you know, attracting bears or mountain lions, you know, depending on where you live. I mean, these are things that could happen. Um, and so it's about, it's about attracting appropriate wildlife, and we try to teach people how to, what I call, sort of, you know, live in, in harmony or avoid conflict with other wildlife species. So, you know, we do try to keep, give people tips on, you know, plant a, a garden for butterflies, but also make sure that you store your trash in a secure trash bin so that the raccoons don't get into it. You know, if you live in bear country, don't put your trash cans out on, on the corner. Um, you know, we have tips on keeping your plants from getting all munched from the deer. Um, you know, people love or hate deer. It's just like with squirrels. And so, so yeah, it's about, it's about doing all those things. And, and, and we recognize that not everybody wants every kind of, um, you know, every kind of wildlife species and or plant. When it comes to the weed question, yeah. um, you know, again, the idea here is that you can implement these four things, food, water, cover, places to raise young. And if you want... You know, as far as your garden design goes, you can make a very sort of naturalistic or wild looking garden, you know, a meadow garden. Um, you know, you can let a, per a portion of your yard literally just sort of grow wild and see what comes up and manage it that way. Right. Um, but if you live in a neighborhood where, you know, that's really not going to be okay in terms of neighbors and, you know, things like homeowners associations, you can absolutely take these principles and apply them to a, you know, a, a very traditionally sort of traditional looking suburban landscape. You can even have a very formal looking landscape where things are neat and in rows and geometric plate, you know, patterns and things like that. And if you're picking the right plant species and you're making sure that you have the right features in there, it can still be really beneficial to wildlife. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll say this, probably the wildlife like it wild and that's going to be their, their biggest preference. But at the same time, we also recognize that people who choose this kind of gardening and choose this kind of landscaping, they are ambassadors for the whole notion of living a little bit, you know, softer on the earth. And, and if you, if you take it too far, in, you know, too far to one extreme of wild, you actually can hurt the cause. You can get people, you know, sort of having a negative association with it. So we try to, again, right. encourage folks to think in, in balance. And, um, you know, if you do want to have a really wild look or, you know, one of the best habitat features that you can have in your yard, for example, 
example, is a dead tree. We call these things snags, and they are just like they can be like wildlife hotels. Um, as the tree breaks down and deteriorates and branches fall off, you get all sorts of insects moving in, and then the birds come in to get the insects, woodpeckers and other insect-eating birds. Cavities form, and then squirrels and, and birds, you know, owls and, and woodpeckers and, and other cavity-nesting birds, chickadees, bluebirds, things like that. Oh, no. um, maybe even wood ducks will form their nests in there. So, but most people are not going to want a big dead tree in their front yard, right? Right. So you know. one, of my, one of my tips is, you know, if you do have that yeah. kind of feature and, and maybe you do want to have a wild look, think yeah. about maybe doing that at the back of your property right. and making a little bit more of a formal, you know, traditional landscape in the front with the right plants that are still going to provide habitat for wildlife, but neighbors that might not be into the idea would never know the difference. And like I shared with you earlier on an earlier show that we, today we had Lisa Novick on talking about the importance of native plants. Share with us your take on that and when you're doing a wildlife garden, you know, the importance of sticking natively. Yeah. So, um, you know, I touched on that a little bit. The, the whole idea with native plants are, yeah. um, are, again, that they're just the plants that wildlife have evolved with. They're, they're right. the most... Um, they're the most useful when it comes to providing habitat for right. wildlife. The animals, um, the animals and the plants have their life cycles in sync with each other. So, for example, you know, right now, springtime, um, a lot of the plants are, are blooming, you know, flowers are blooming for the first time, um, and those, that's timed with the weather and, and sort of with the, the seasonal change so that those, those plants are providing nectar, for example, for all of the emerging, you know, bees and other pollinating insects. And so, you know, if that gets out of sync, then you start, you know, kind of, you start kind of removing links in the food chain, so to speak, and links right. in that web of life. So if you use native plants, it makes it really easy. You don't even necessarily even have to think about it or worry about it. Mother Nature does the job for you. And again, that's not to say that there are certain ornamental exotic yeah. plants that might not still provide, you know, food or, you know, they might not, it might be a nesting place, but they're not as good at fitting into that, that, that sort of web of life that, that existed before we came in and bulldozed everything. And that's the idea here. You can start putting those pieces back in place and start subtly weaving in some of the really complex um, sort of relationships that form this sort of tapestry of Mother Nature that were there before we changed everything. Um, you know, again, the idea here is that we can give a little bit back and, and, and Again, simple choices. You know, maybe instead of having nothing but lawn, which doesn't really have any habitat value, um, you know, maybe you add some, you know, some some beds where you're planting some native wildflowers or you know an ornamental but still right. native shrub. And that's another important point here too. Um, a, a sort of a misperception is that again, native plants are just weeds. Totally not true. I yeah. mean, some of our most common ornamental landscaping plants are native. Purple coneflowers are a great example. Black-eyed Susans, flowering dogwoods, just a few of the very commonly planted, um, you know, sort of ornamental landscape plants that are completely native. So, you know, again, if you go to our website, uh, it's nwf.org slash garden, we've got some really great native plant resources, lists of native plants. We actually even have a, a native plant program called American Beauties. And this is a really neat program where the, the garden industry actually came to the National Wildlife Federation and said, you know, we recognize that, there, that there's a need out there to be doing better when it comes to providing appropriate plant material that is native, and we want to work with you. And so we've got this great program that is, um, it's regional right now, but our goal is to sort of spread it all around the country and, and get some of these beautiful, amazingly diverse native plants out there into the marketplace so that folks can be planting the stuff that, you know, again, that is going to benefit wildlife and fit best in, into nature. So you can get that all on the website. David, we have about a minute left. Any final thoughts for our listeners out there? Because you're, you're, you're just, uh, you know, you're, you're so articulate and you really get the message out. Well, the big thing is, is that this May is the third annual Garden for Wildlife Month. And so our goal with Garden for Wildlife Month is to get as many people out there to create a wildlife-friendly garden and certify it with the National Wildlife Federation. All the instructions are up on that website, nwf.org slash garden. When you do that, not only do you, um, you know, you, you're doing something good for wildlife, but if you certify your yard, you get a great certificate, you can purchase a yard sign, you become a National Wildlife Federation member, lots of really great benefits. And if you do it during the month of May for Garden for Wildlife Month, NWF will plant a tree in your name. So the value of creating a wildlife-friendly garden is going to go a, a long way. And what we're trying to do is get 4,000 people within the month of May to certify their garden. So hopefully lots of the listeners will go out 
check out the website, make some simple changes in their yard. It doesn't have to be hard. And then they'll be able to participate in Garden for Wildlife Month. Oh, that would be just wonderful. And again, David, we thank you for coming back on today. You're always welcome back on. Green is good. For our listeners, one last time, www.nwf.org. It's it's an amazing website. I've been looking at it while David's been uh, you know, sharing his great story. David, you're an inspirational environmental evangelist and ambassador and truly living proof that green is good. 